Okay, hi. Um, for those of you in person, we do have folks joining us via Zoom, and then we're also live streaming on Facebook. So I am going to say hello to some folks who aren't here as well. So hello to those of you in, uh, in the virtual sphere, and of course, hello to, to um, those of you joining us in person today. Uh, my name is Liz Erlewine, and I am the Visual Arts Director here at Crooked Tree Arts Center. I'm based in Petoskey. We just did one of these yesterday in Petoskey for our exhibition there, but I'm really thrilled to be here in Traverse City um, to welcome you to the exhibition that we have on display here in our Carnegie Galleries. Uh, today's event will be a walking gallery tour. So those of you joining virtually, bear with us as we roll around and uh, take a look at some of the pieces and participate in the conversation. To all of you, virtual and in person, it will be conversational. Patrick is open to questions and interruptions. We're just here to chat about the work. Um, and, and get to learn a little bit more. So please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question and contribute to the conversation as you need to, okay? Uh, so welcome. Um, I'm really thrilled that this exhibition uh, is here in Traverse City right now. Uh, the conversation uh, started many months ago. Um, we had intended to show this exhibition um, when we then had to close the doors for, for COVID. So it was postponed. Um, and, and we were finally able to find a, a date and time that works, and I'm so thrilled that we were. Um, we've been moving towards thematic approaches to our exhibitions, both in Petoskey and Traverse City. And even though uh, fall 2021 here in, in Crooked Tree has been a shuffle and a reorganization because of those 2020 closures, uh, I was really thrilled to reschedule some exhibitions to come together uh, with some some related ideas. We have um, three distinct exhibitions going on right now in the fall. Um, we have Lustron Stories by Charles Mintz, which is on our lower level here in, in the Cornwell Galleries. Uh, Charles will be joining us for a virtual coffee at 10 uh, later in October and, and then visit us at, at the conclusion of his show. So keep an eye out for those dates and opportunities. Uh, Lustron Stories is an exhibition that um, looks at kit homes from the 1950s that have been placed throughout Ohio and across the U.S. Um, and it's really looking at home accessibility and what it means to, to achieve the American dream. Uh, in Petoskey, we have an exhibition called Kindred, Traditional Arts of the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians. Um, this exhibition is an opportunity to really um, highlight some of the amazing indigenous artists and artwork that happens uh, in the Petoskey region. Uh, that exhibition takes us through cultural context and histories while highlighting over 160 unique original works of art, mostly by uh, still living artists. And then we're here today um, with Patrick Hammy's exhibition, Forward. Uh, and this exhibition, we'll let Patrick tell us all about it. Um, um, but I was really excited to bring Patrick's work to our galleries for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the phenomenal skill. I mean, those of you who've had a chance to see the artwork already and be here in the, in the space, um, and you'll see in a moment here at our virtual audiences, just the amazing uh, ability Patrick has to, to capture the figure, to capture emotion, and to work with these um, materials of, of paint and charcoal, mix them together in, in this very um, amazing and skillful way. Um, but they're, they're really emotive, and, and they really reflect a, a personal relationship with the subject matter as well as that material. Um, and this exhibition is very personal in nature, um, and we're going to have a moment here to take a look at how they relate to Patrick's own personal identity and, and personal stories. So together, these exhibitions are a chance for us uh, to really recognize the diversity of, of art in America today and uh, a chance to highlight some really amazing contemporary voices. So with that, I would like to welcome Patrick to, to clip this mic on and we will we'll start and take a look at the work. Thanks, Patrick. Welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Liz and Megan and Crooked Tree Arts Center. Um, it's so very, such a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to be here to share my stories with you, to share my work with you. Uh, as Liz mentioned, this was a, a work in progress for a while and I'm so happy that the team stuck with me and we kept this on the books and here it is, we're here, we're here today. Uh, welcome everybody who's remote. Um, pleasure to virtually meet you. Uh, looking forward to sharing this with you as well. 
So I've been a professional artist and teacher for about 15 years now. I teach at the University of Illinois. Uh, originally, I'm from Connecticut, uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, did my undergraduate in South Carolina, and my graduate uh, degree was from UConn in Connecticut. Over this course of 15 years of making and teaching, I can summate that most of my work looks at a few questions. I, I ask from, from where and by whom do we narrate and commune with our past? What stories have I inherited? What narratives have I inherited? And how can I share stories that open up space to understand others differently? And that's where my work centers around and that's where it, this work begins. So this project and the works you see in the gallery uh, are part of a series called Birth Rows. Birth Rows originated, um, as many of my works do, from a very personal place, but also the personal allows me to look out into the public. So if I could, I would like to start with a portrait of my mother and through, her, through that painting and the stories around that, kind of open you up to how this work came to be, what I'm trying to communicate, and then we'll talk about several different works. Now, the format I love to, to encourage is uh, feel free to ask questions along the way, but after each, each work I'll talk about, feel free to please ask questions about that explicit work if you have them. So I don't want you to feel like you have to hold on to all your thoughts, thoughts and ideas to the end. And same thing with those that are at home or remotely. Uh, please put your questions in the chat and I will be happy to answer them. So if everybody who's here, if you feel comfortable, could you please join me over in front of this painting? Okay, um, so this is a painting of my mother. Her name is Carolyn Romaine Hammy, or Carolyn uh, Nay, Nay Harrison. Um, she was born in 1944, and she was a telephone operator for AT&T Bell for 30 years and retired after that. And uh, her and my father and me uh, moved to South Carolina, where she's originally from. And uh, I, I grew up half my life there. Um, so I'm from New England, but I, really can claim South Carolina as, as much as home as possible. And now I'm in the Midwest <laughs> for, for 12 years now, and I, I really find this place to be home to. Um, so the work really begins with this painting and a painting of my grandmother. The project began in part as a reflection on my mother's stroke in 2015. Um, the stroke took away her ability to move, physically move. She was uh, bedridden and, and, and constrained to a wheelchair. And it took away her voice, a voice she used for 30 years to speak as a telephone operator, to connect people nationally, internationally. Um, I was very fortunate that she was still very, she was still completely cognizant. Uh, my wife and I would visit her weekly and share our stories of the week, our, all our gossip, we'd spill the tea. And, um, and she'd, she'd be really entertained. We, we'd watch uh, stories and comedy specials, which were some of our favorite things to do. And um, I was really thankful for that time I had another six years until uh, she was taken by COVID last year. Um, but in 2015, when she had this stroke, our relationship changed dramatically. I, I moved her to Illinois from South Carolina where she was staying, living independently, and uh, moved her about five minutes away into a facility that could care for her 24 seven. And um, we were visiting her one day in the facility and maybe a couple months after she had, she had moved and settled in and we're hanging outside in, in, the, in the, the promenade and uh, I, I want to take a photograph of her and I asked her to smile. I was like, mom, hey, give me a smile. And she gave me this fierce look. And I was like, mom, give, give me a smile. And she looked at me fiercely again and she raised her fist and she shook it. And she was telling me who she was now, who she was becoming, and that she was fighting. She was a fighter. She was a survivor. And that's when I began this painting. I took that photograph and the painting did a few things. It allowed me to 
understand that she was a different person to give her space to become this new person that she was um for me to reconcile with our new roles and relationships me as as a caregiver um and allowing any kinds of thoughts or ideas that i, I romanticized of her from the past to kind of be incorporated but 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 give more space for me to not hold bitterness at what i was lost but what was being gained and the fact that she was still teaching me so much she was teaching me how to fight and how to live even after her stroke so uh, many of those kinds of narratives are tied up into this painting uh, i hope they come through in the gaze i hope they come through in the the, the physicality of the painting process and the scale as I mentioned earlier, my work starts very personal, but also moves out to the public. So for me, this work is also symbolic of what's within the frame, also what the painting itself can do. And so many um, institutions, or actually, that's, that's, let, me, let me correct that. There are so few examples and in institutions of aging women, of, of, of women with clothes on, of aging women and of Black women being centered and her stories being foregrounded as important and relevant to our cultural experience. And so in part, this work, I did a work of my grandmother and my great grandmother, her mother, or her, her grandmother, um, as part of this, this effort to create more images and more, ex, more occasions for us to encounter women with stories like this. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, <laughs> technical or conceptual. Yes. Oil on linen. Oil. No charcoal in this one. Yes. Uh, it, yeah. So so part of as I've been working on this painting and this project, I've been pulling the images a little further and further away from the edges. So the edges are a little bit more live. They're not all the way to the edge and trying to cover that up. I really like the, the, the kind of physicality, especially in manual photography. I love artists like Sally Mann and the plates are so alive in her work. And so like having this history of the process at the bottom, for example, like dripping and, and just leaving that narrative and all that, 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 that labor there, I feel like it just adds to the dynamic of the piece. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, so my background's in drawing. Um, I had a professor who was of German heritage and he loved everything German, German expressionism, Gestalt, and push and strung and drum and push and pull and all of that. And I embedded it in, in me as, as a student. And so my drawings, when I was, when I was doing more explicitly just drawing, were very much expression and motive and, and about the push and pull and about the pentimenti and the process. And as I moved from undergraduate, where I learned a lot of those lessons, to graduate, I, I, I delved more into paint. And it took years <laughs> for me to, to find a way for that language in charcoal and in drawing to communicate into paint. And so when I paint, I now have, have developed a comfortability and an ability to, to move through my paintings and the layering process very similarly as I do with charcoal, with time for drying. <laughs> so patience is another medium I had to nurture. But, but yeah, laying down a, a mark, um, being able to use paint to think about erasing a mark, and it's not always an A to B of like, I start and I try to get to a finish, but I make some choices, I take some notes on the surface, and then I respond and react. And so it's about a dialogue with the a collaboration with the paint, what the paint can do and what I can bring to it and not just dictating to the paint to do what I want it to do. So some of that process and that thinking has led to the way I layer paint, the way I, what I leave um, exposed and what I uh, kind of refine and cover up in the, in the painting process. Yes. I have, yeah, um, except for maybe some early, early paintings when I first started figuring out like, what is this stuff all about? Those were some acrylics 
And then I moved into water soluble oil paint. Um, but eventually, yeah, I just went to it straight up traditional oil painting. So if I could quote Willem de Kooning, oil painting was made to paint flesh. And I've been a fan of figuration since I was a child. First, it started with cartoons and comics and then real people and life drawing classes. So when I got to moving into painting, it just the captures the luminosity and the translucency of and, and, of and the chromatic gorgeousness of flesh. And that's really important to me in a very kind of straightforward, obvious sense, and like, like in terms of like what Willem de Kooning was talking about. But as I've been painting more and more brown and black people, um, I've noticed that the scholarship or the learning around how to do that beautifully and dynamically isn't necessarily broad. And so as an instructor, I've been teaching my students as I've been learning, how do you render brown and black flesh as dynamically and beautifully as the centuries and centuries of, of lighter skin? Um, how do you layer? It's different than, than layering, you know, um, vermilion red and yellow ochre nor, and building that up over like burnt sienna to get, you know, someone who's a lighter skin. Like there's different ways and different things you have to think about, different amounts of color you have to keep in mind. Um, and so, um, so yeah, oil paint offers up all those possible and time to work through it. I know you can add like gel mediums to acrylic and extend the drying time, but the, the time that oil paint affords to really think is, is also a benefit. Yes. In in like paintings? Yeah. So, so Yeah, so in, in in paintings, if you see paintings that are painted, uh, there's no charcoal. So I sketch with oil and I keep building from there. Um, and then the, the, the works that are in charcoal, a lot, a lot of spray fixative. <laughs> yes, uh, I, use, I use two types. I use a workable fixative, a lot of it, um, good ventilation, and, um, and a clear acrylic sealer. It's a little bit crystallized. And so if you feel the surface, don't feel the surface. But if you feel the surface, um, you can feel like some crystallized textures. It really seals things in as UV protection. So that's, um, that's how I've been working with when I do just charcoal works. But yeah, the paintings are all uh, oil. Even the underpainting and the sketching is all oil. Um, I kind of, yeah, I've, I've I try to sketch in charcoal and then build up on top of that. And I might come back to that, you know, I never ever rule anything out as a really fun process, but um, I've just really liked the, the kind of direct path to write, to, to think, think as drawing with, with oil paint all, immediately. Yes. So I, I definitely, my wife sometimes calls me a Luddite. <laughs> Um, maybe it's because I love old media that I have slowly begun to uh, use more and more uh, newer technologies. I've been really good at documenting and photographs the process. So while I work after almost every sitting, which could be three hours or eight hours, uh, depending on how late I work, um, I'll photograph the work and keep those to have that kind of record so I can see how things change and how I've been thinking about the work evolves and, and, and develop a kind of relationship with the work that way. I've been using video more and more. I still haven't gotten to full on time lapse and things like that, but I think it's happening. I just, the studio for a long time was so solitary. That was just me. And I'd go in there, I'd put the music on and we could talk about music. Nothing happens in the studio without music, by the way. Put the music on and just go. But more recently, I've been working with more assistants and it's just the, the, the studio has been a little bit more communal. And so uh, there's been more opportunities for people to just pick up an iPhone and capture it while I'm working. No one ask me, I mean, they ask me later, but they, uh, but so that's been capturing some more kind of impromptu things. That's been really nice. Do you have those photographs of your process available on the Yes, so if you're on Facebook, I know some, some of you are on Facebook right now, you can uh, go to my artist page, which Facebook's reorganized things, but it's Patrick Rohami. It's an artist page, public page. 
And if you go into some of the projects, you'll see some of those photographs, some of those steps. Like uh, one specifically, one project is Significant Other, which is two figures um, basically like, you know, interacting with each other. And there's several images of those in progress uh, in that folder. All right. <laughs> so when I say I listen to everything, I really do mean it. Uh, one of my dream, two of my dreams when I was young was to work at a Blockbuster, check, <laughs> when Blockbuster was a thing, um, and to work in a music store, check. And so before most of those kind of disappeared and now are we coming back, I did work in a music store. And so like, I really love all kinds of music. I have a, a background in singing. I started when I was uh, in fourth grade and had the opportunity to sing at many different places, all different types of music, a lot of uh, classical music, a lot of secular uh, choirs and through, through universities and through colleges and, and, and such. Traveling to sing, I had a chance to sing at St. Patrick's Cathedral um, in New York, had a chance to sing at Carnegie um, in an ensemble. And um, so I, I love classical music as well. So definitely classical music is in there. Um, I love kind of uh, certain types of jazz. I like Sun Ra, um, it is amazing. I love everything that could be uh, kind of threaded back to Afrofuturism or go to Earth, Wind and Fire and all that, Cool in the Gang. Um, hip hop is, is definitely in there, but I equally love, I equally put on Chicago you know, or, or, you know, Queen. Um, and so, yeah, like, I definitely have music for every occasion. Um, there is music for getting in a studio and kind of getting psyched up and getting the energy going. There's music for painting uh, and working sometimes in, in drawing. There's music for, um, for just reflecting. I tell my students that you, it's good practice to look at your work and spend time with it as much as you do making it, if you have that privilege. And so um, I'll go into the studio and there'll be a day where I don't actually paint, I just spend time with the work. I might be responding to emails, but I'm just looking at it. And so, uh, and there's music for that too. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, I typically don't calculate it in that way. So I have to think about it. <sighs> yeah, well, it's, it's shifted, it's changed. So the reason it's, it's, hard, it's hard for me to kind of lock down that answer is one, my schedule is very fluid. So I get a lot of time to work, but it's working and switch tasking between painting in a studio, keeping up kind of uh, the, the, the business side of the art practice, whether it's sending out grant proposals, writing grant proposals, um, keeping up the website and things like that, to teaching, to administrative work, to family time, back to the studio. And so it all kind of gets mixed in and, and, and happens in this kind of dynamic way. And so um, that's kind of why it's hard to, to kind of pitch exactly how many hours went into it. Also what's changed, as I mentioned, the studio has been really solitary. As I've expanded more and more and more people are in the studio, there's more assistants are in the studio. I used to work at, a, like, I would work on two paintings at this size at the same time and go back and forth between the two. And that was very normal for me for a while. But um, then I had a wonderful assistant who came in and just from their energy and their help, I started working on seven canvases at once. And we would just cycle through the canvases. And so there'd be even more things in progress at different stages. And so um, that really, I think, this was the second project where that was fully employed. So I could work on this and then it'd be put down for a month or so. And then I'd be working on other things and then come back to this and work on it. So I, I wish I had a really concrete answer. I have a concrete answer for the next painting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which I'll, 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 I'll start off with. But for this one, it's, it, it, it just took, I would say, time was love. <laughs> it took a while. One more um, process question then. Um, we talk about bringing assistance in Studio. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that relationship and what roles they take? I mean, I imagine some of our listeners are not familiar with that idea at all. Yeah, so yeah. Do, yeah. Yeah. So um, I was in when I was in residence at the Kohler Art Center uh, in 2011. 
I had a great residency mate named Jeremy Hatch, who was a master ceramicist. And I had done some ceramics and sculpture, but they usually like to bring in people that have some experience and people that have a lot of experience. And so I, I was the one with just some. <laughs> and he was utilizing a lot more of the facilities, a lot more assistants would come in and help him. And it was the first time I, I saw that myself. And I was like, he's getting a lot of work done. And, and it seems a lot more energetic and lively. And, and I'm over here doing my thing and it's great. But, um, and so when I got back to my studio in, in 2011, uh, I slowly began to open my, my whole, my process to, to that. And it took a while to figure out like, okay, well, what is that dynamic between myself as the maker? And I know there are extremes. So if many of you might've heard of an, of a, of an artist named Jeff Koons, right? And Jeff Koons does an amazing, he ma makes amazing work and um, creates amazing opportunities for, for artists, particularly in New York, to have fully employed positions with benefits and everything. So they're well supported. Um, but some of the criticisms are that most of the work is made by the assistants, by the artisans that he worked, that work for him. And the line between what is an artist and who is the artist becomes a little more blurry. But, you know, in, as being a, a student of art history, many of the artists that were privileged enough and at the top of, of kind of the the level of success that, that get into the art history books, that was very normal. I mean, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, all, I mean, they, they had a team of people that helped them. Some of them were students, some of them were full of art, artisans. So that stigma, I had to quickly get over in my own practice of being this kind of isolated artist that was like toiling away by himself and making these things. So um, I asked myself, what could assistants do that would really be beneficial? Some of it was just, very nuts and bolts of like helping me stretch things. You know, like I could not stretch this by myself easily. So like, you know, how do I get someone just on the other side to hold it while I can pull and staple things down? And, and so that was very pragmatic. Um, I don't know if any of you are fans of the TV show House. I hope I'm not as abusive as the character <laughs> House is, but having a team or, or one or two people to bounce ideas off of is also important. So I'll be in the studio working and thinking, and I'll just throw things out. Just hearing them back, you know, gives me a sounding board sometimes. So that's sometimes part of it. Um, but really, really, really comes down to is um, what I've learned over time that helps a lot with the labor is mixing. Artists spend, painters, especially at a scale like this, spend probably 70% of our time mixing paint. I could walk into the studio and just mix for three, four hours before I even think about touching the surface, just to get my paints ready for that day. Sometimes it's breaking up old paint that's on, this can on the palette. Sometimes it's mixing up new colors that I need to use for that day. And so um, assistants that can come in and know color, understand how I work, um, and can help mix a lot of paint, a lot of paint, so I can get big house paint brushes and then slather on nice sized marks that really uh, have a heft to them has been a huge part in, in some of the ways that I've built up relationships with. with uh, but it's also uh, an opportunity to help um, kind of create a, a more, more direct conversation between me and the assistance of professional channels and practices and you know, what, what they're doing in their work and where they might want to go. So it's not just one way. It's, you know, it's, um, it's a chance for me to, just like in the classroom, but in a different situation, to kind of help generate and nurture another generation of artists. Yes. What you were just talking about made me think of the brown face or the brown figure. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to change the tones. I mean, you said it was. Could you make you put those colors to write it down so that someone else, so that, that next time you do it, you might use the same colors together? Oh yeah, I have a whole system. So I have huge glass palettes. That's what I work on, glass palettes. Um, so I have huge glass palettes and um, I've really been trying to use technology more to help. And so a lot of the works I work with, just from the scale of them, it's, it would be kind of inhumane to have people pose for me for months and months. <laughs> so I work from photographs more frequently. Um, because they're, the photographs are static, I can use uh, programs like Adobe Photoshop to color pick and go in and find out, okay, what colors are in this? And then from that, you know, figure out which colors am I most interested in using? 
And then as I commu can communicate that to myself or to a, a, an assistant, we'll mix up a color and then take what's called a hex code, which is um, if you ever color pick, it's like hashtag and a bunch of numbers. And it tells, it's, it's how the computer understands what color that is. And we'll take a piece of tape and put it on that, like next to that color and write that code. So if we ever need to go back and mix more of it, we can just type that into the, to the computer and be like, we need more of this. So that's a way of keeping track. Yeah. But I'd love to kind of migrate into this next work and keep this conversation going. Hope, hope you can see me. <laughs> please ask, keep, please keep asking questions. Okay, well, everyone, I'm gonna ask a question. So, cause it, it works for both of these. Um, when, as I mentioned to you, um, I was really struck by the physicality of the scale. I had anticipated before they were here, I knew what size they were, but when you read a piece in person, mm -hmm. it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how you decide what scale to work at and how important that is to you to consider scale with your painting? Yes, so a question of scale, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> originally, my, my relationship to scale came when I was an undergrad there was a non-traditional student who was also a librarian, but was getting their, her degree in, in drawing. And I was a freshman coming into the, to the uh, university for the first time. And um, she had her thesis exhibition. There were huge drawings that were like wall size uh, on heavy watercolor paper. And it's the first time I've ever seen anything like that in person. I was so impressed. They were so physical. And I mean, there was, there was like, it got to the point where if she needed to erase and the paper just wouldn't take any more erasure, she'd take duct tape, put it on the watercolor paper and then rip it back to white. And I was like, you can do that? And so like that really inspired me, like what large scale works could do, how they could physically affect you. Because up to that point, everything I'd seen had been either on TV or in, in books or, you know, you know, something like that. I just wasn't, my parents are very encouraging of art, but you know, besides school trips, uh, I didn't necessarily go to museums or get, that was not my experience growing up. Um, my art came from other things, like, like I mentioned, cartoon, and comics, and things that were more accessible on the day-to-day -day like that, posters. Um, so when I went to my, to my senior exhibition, I wanted to kind of recapture some of that. So my, that was my first attempt at, at making large scale, I was making large scale drawings at that time. And that bug never left me. I got to graduate school and you know, after a semester of experimenting at kind of a medium size, when it got to like starting to do the work that I want to do to talk about my, my work, I want to talk about ultimately for my thesis, I did return to a larger scale. Over time, um, I became more critical of my relationship to that scale. I, in short, I kind of, so we have a history in art especially in 20th century, but going back, especially in, in you know, kind of Eurocentric painting um, of a certain type of masculinity, a certain type of chest beating that happens with that kind of heroic scale. And, you know, maybe to keep the, 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 the kind of uh, references going to other types of media, I thought about Rocky, strangely enough, and, and like the, the, the character in the movies, Vesta Stallone, and, um, you know, how a strategy of his was to use what they call unboxing a rope-a-dope, where, you know, you, you feign that like you're getting more beat up than you are, and then you come out swinging. And I was thinking as I was going through graduate school, working at this heroic scale, that maybe these paintings have that opportunity to draw people into what they expect to be, you know, a traditional or historically masculine statement. And those works um, were about being critical of those, those ways of learning masculinity. That project was called Imperfect Colossi, where I was using my own brown body, my own imperfect brown body that had lost a lot of weight. I was 300 pounds for a while, lost a lot of weight. I was using my own skin and, and body to kind of wrench and pull at it to imagine the, my body like a piece of clay, which was maybe the beginning of some of how the heroic sculptures or colossies that, you know, uh, um, old master sculptors would have made to, to represent heroes of the past. But instead of representing an ideal, 
with, you know, like an ideal self or ideal, like as more of my body as a proposal of a work in progress, like the clay sculptures, they could be molded and changed. So there wasn't this, this kind of aim or this way that we should be men or perform masculinity, but there are many ways and they're reshapable. And so that's where my relationship to scale kind of came in. Um, over the years, it continues to evolve. And sometimes there's need for the works to be large, just for me physically to put that kind of emotion into them. And sometimes the intimacy of the works are, are, are really important. So shrinking things down so people can really get in close and have a really intimate moment is, is some of my considerations. Great question, thank you. So this is definitely one of those that is large. <laughs> so this painting, and to kind of answer, get back to your question, this painting took nine months of actual work. Um, I did keep track of this one. And uh, at the end of it, at the end, end of the nine months, uh, I was giving a lecture like this and uh, someone asked how long this painting take, took. And after I thought about it, I was like, nine months. And then my wife made a very, you know, uh, ironic nod to the fact that, you know, it took me nine months to paint a painting about gestation. <laughs> um, so this painting is titled Untimely Ripped. It, it depicts an, an, an allegory that never actually happened, but is an allegory to my birth. I mean, my birth happened, but, but it happened like this. <laughs> this was uh, called from a copyleft source. So copyleft is different than copyright. Copyleft is images that they want you to use and take as long as you cite them properly. And they want you to take them and evolve them and change them. So originally, some, a lot of this pose came from a photographer, which is cited in the, in the in the label. Um, and then I took that original image and then changed a lot of things to kind of build off of it and, and create an allegory that spoke specifically to my birth. Most obviously is this was not me <laughs> in the original. Also, all of the doctors and nurses are women. Um, this work, I believe, I'll talk about where it comes from personally in a second, but, but our historically, we've seen many, many works of surgical excellence and profession like uh, um, Thomas Aiken's Gross Clinic, for example. Uh, but those works are typically dominated by men. And what, in the case of the Gross Clinic, for example, the only woman, if I don't have the image in front of me, but the only woman in the painting is turned away in horror in the, in the theater of, of surgery, you know, as if she couldn't take it, it was too much for her. So what I hope to do is change and add, add some more dimension to um, uh, the kinds of medical professionals we encounter as, women as, as doctors and as nurses um, and as mothers. Now this work uh, for me uh, also comes out of this project of birth throes. As my mother uh, lost the ability to speak, some of what runs through all of this is, it coincided with a time of, of when I was reaching an age where now I was hyper curious about my family past, my family's history, and she can never, no longer share that primarily with me. I'd have to go to aunts and, and, and those who survived. Um, and the, the mythos around even my birth was now becoming very, I was very interested and fascinated. Like, what is that all about? What, and how do I enter and how do I think about that more and more? And as I delved into my own um, birth and how I might think about representing that for everything I had just said before, it became really, I became really quickly attuned to other reasons why I was fascinated by it. I was fascinated by it because in 20, between 2015 and 2017, just being inundated like many of you with uh, daily examples through social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter of uh, how easily black life was taken from this world. And it just became oppressive. And importantly so, important to share and see these, these atrocities that were happening in our public spaces, but every day just being hit and inundated by it. Um, I asked myself in the broader context of this project, what can I do to, within what I do to, uh, to provide different ways of thinking about this experience? So for me to work through it personally, but also provide occasion for others. So this particular piece, Untimely Ripped, uh, was kind of at the time, uh, a, 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 a painting that brought together many of the ideas I was thinking about in this project. Uh, for example, I wanted to create a space that united um, 
women's labor and, and, and knowledge in terms of who's being represented and what they know. All the time, energy and, and that it took to gain those skills, to go to school, to go into debt, the, um, the risk, emotional and psychological labor of the mother to go through labor and to bring a child to bear. Our community and the way we contribute through tax dollars and other ways to build an infrastructure of a hospital system like this that leads to all ultimately the bringing of one black life into this world. And if we can consider the bringing of one black life into this world at all or differently, it might help us have a different conversation of what it means to rip a black life from this world. So that's some of how I was thinking about this painting and what came out as I was making it. I'm also a nerd. Uh, and if anybody in here was catching some theater illusions, anybody? So Untimely Ripped, if you want to keep going down the rabbit hole with me, is uh, the name given to uh, the character Macduff in the play Macbeth, who was prophesized uh, to not be born of a woman, which in, in spoilers for 500 year play, um, which was cesarean, which was a cesarean section. I was born cesarean section, 52% of Americans are born cesarean. Um, that creating that connection to Macduff, who was prophesied to be born that way, but was also prophesied to bring down the tyrant that Macbeth had become by the end of the play for me allowed space to imagine um, through that illusion, that connection, that the coming of, 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 of his birth, depending on your vantage point, could be a call to action or, or hope, but also a warning to those that practice tyrannical behaviors, that there are others coming that might challenge that, as Macduff, as Macduff did for Macbeth. So that is, those are some of the layers that I'm thinking about when I'm building up the work physically making it, but also, um, you know, how it might resonate for years after I'm gone for, for people that are interested in asking those questions. So please, uh, any questions, thoughts, objections? <laughs> yes. Um, so it's interesting to think of that layering. So two questions with that. Okay. One is how much you determine that before you begin executing the painting? what you want to include in that allegory. Mm -hmm. And then also, how important is it that, that a viewer know that mm -hmm. when they approach the piece? Those are great questions. So, uh, so the question was, how much is predetermined and how important is it that those layers are, are accessible? Um, first, as I was mentioning with, with my painting my mother, it's a dialogue. And so some of the ideas are in my head some of them are lived, some of them are in my bones, right? Like I'm, I've always been thinking about many of these things, just we just live. I try to be sensitive to my life and what's happening, what's happening in my life, what's happening in the world. So really it's just trying to stay listening for when those things need to come out. But also, as I mentioned with the painting itself, like the collaborative nature, as I'm working on it, what is the painting telling me? What is it communicating? What is it saying to me? Why, why, why do I need to make this? And why is it important that this exists in the world? what potential does it have to communicate my story, but also beyond me to those that don't care about what I'm talking and thinking about <laughs> personally, what I'm experiencing. And so all those things are developed over a series, in this case, nine months, but over time as I'm making the work, um, and it's, it's always a, a level of degree, like it's not, they're not always having to be that much layering to them, but but for me, for any work to exist in the world, I ask myself, okay, why am I putting more things into the world? You know, is it just because I can, or is there something else that I like to share? And that can kind of gets me to the point of like the layers. So I love this question. Um, I'm a big, so I mentioned before, I'm a nerd, but also a nerd, of, of, I'm a cinephile. I love movies, I love te television, I love horror and sci-fi and all these kind of fun things. And when I was, um, 17, the same year, the same year my dad passed away, but a couple months before, I didn't know he was going to pass away prematurely. Um, I watched this movie called The Matrix, which is now coming out again, all these years later. Um, and I was blown away as a young person at its artisticness. Like people love all the, the cool things that go on, but I was really seeing the layers. 
I was in audience, mind being blown, as many people's were. But I was like, okay, I could just watch this and enter into the explosions and the car chases. And that's cool. That's all I need. That could be just enough, right? You like Fast and the Furious? That's all you need. That and Vin Diesel talking about family. That's cool. Um, if you want to go a little bit deeper, you can get into the, the Gung Fu and the Wushu and the, and the wire work, and that's really cool. If you want to go a little bit further, you can start thinking about the interpersonal relationships between Trinity and Neo or Trinity, Neo, Neo and Morpheus. If you want to go a bit higher than that, you can start getting into the little tiny references. I'm thinking like a food pyramid here, right? Get into little tiny references of like uh, to Nietzsche or to Alice in Wonderland and following the right rabbit. All of that is there. The Wachowski sisters thought about all of this as, as people kind of could enter into the story from so many different facets. I hope that those types of layers are in this. If you just want to see a scene of birth that you typically don't encounter, here we go. I mean, it's such a, it's such a space that we're segregated from. Most people don't spend time with death or birth unless it's very personal. It's just culturally, we don't. So if that is an occasion for you to have a different experience, then that's there. If you want to think about your own personal experience, I've talked to many mothers and nurses and doctors preparing and researching for this. And some of them had such profound reactions to just the, the, um, the gown that she wears, like remembering they had that gown on when they were going through this process. Um, if you want to th think about representation of women in art and in history, you can. If you want to think about um, uh, all those layers I just mentioned before, it, they're there for you. Or you can just stay at a surface and enjoy the paint. Like I love, I had a fun time like laying down so much red paint if you get close to this. And then knowing that these kinds of like, like a cerulean gowns of the, of, the, of the nurses and doctors were gonna be on top of this red and how they vibrate where the red pokes through. That's just fun paint for me. So if you just wanna enjoy paint, that's cool too. Like, like the matrix, that's what I hope when I'm building in all my works, that those layers are there for those who want to access. My wife's an art historian, by the way. And so I have to say that our conversations are very helpful, but also gives me a sense of scale in terms of like, there are going to be some people who are nerdy like me that when they look back at the works will want to chew on something and, and find the meaning. And I hope that I've done what I can to make sure the meaning is there. And then they can make up things they want to make up because I won't be around. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm sure that this is it always happens in large paintings, but I'm struck by the vibrancy of the foreground and the quietness of the background, the almost coldness of the background. Um, I mean, it, I, I think that could come down to some compositional decisions of just uh, where to try to encourage the focus. Um, yeah, as we enter in from the upper left compositionally, how the lights here, which are dim, but very, very dominant, can point you down to the baby. Um, how this line, if you're following down, this line will catch you, boom, 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 boom and drive you down to here where they're all looking down to here and keep you moving around here. This line, which is actually there when the tarp is, is, is kind of pulled back, but also how it can you know, stop you and sling you back around, or you can spend time down here. And if you are, you can kind of work in that minutia. Little Easter eggs, like uh, my actual time of birth being embedded in the clock, things like that, if, if, you, if you so care <laughs> to know. So the background, even though, you know, yes, I do try to keep it a little more quiet so the foreground gets foregrounded. <laughs> um, I still find it so important. I, I, I think keep in my own mind, but also tell my students so frequently. The background in particular, but even, even the things that as the maker, you don't really find that fascinating and want to pay attention to, you need to pay attention to them more so. Because if they have not been considered or more considered in the thing that is actually exciting to you as the maker, um, it might be distracting for your audience. So don't forget the background. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right, right. Just start dropping it into, yeah. Um, so this work, I did work on it actually about at this height for most of it. Uh, some of it precariously, I was on a chair and I think I gave my wife a heart attack some days. 
being up on a chair, trying to paint up there. But when I had to get down here and if sitting in a seat wasn't enough, I literally would raise this up and like the bottom would be about here. So I didn't have to like lay on the ground and, and paint. I would just literally, and I work on, on the wall like this. So I have nails on the wall and I can hang them on the stretcher bars on the back. And so like the stretch, there's a stretcher bar here and here. And so right now it's being hung by up there. I would just like move it to be hung on that. And so I could move it up and down the wall to, pra to practically work on it, yeah. <laughs> who is normally here, but she's out, out of the office. We, you know, we had to make some changes for the layout, and, mm -hmm. and she just made a comment about how now she loves the idea of uh, the painting of your mother here, looking on at the, at the birth story of Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's such a, you know, so I see many, many of these works are wrapped up most of the time, you know, unless they're out for shows um, or in collections. Uh, in the studio, I keep them wrapped up to make sure they're preserved, but also I feel more inspired to make when less of my stuff is visible. I need to fill my face with more of my stuff. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I don't see them out this often. And when I came up the other day uh, upstairs and my wife and I talked about this afterward, you know, walking through the show was, was really fascinating and exciting. The space is gorgeous, but particularly walking up to that work after not kind of seeing it out um, uh, that work by people on, uh, on Zoom um, uh, is my mother. And walking up to my mother's portrait and just seeing it kind of exposed and in, 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 in full color was, uh, it, 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 it brought back all those feelings, you know, but now that she's passed, it's, it's, it's different. And I'm, I haven't had a chance to process that. But I thank you for creating this opportunity because I'll be thinking about how these works now sit together after that for me, because this was done before she had passed away and, you know, and she had, she had seen these works, but now this is what a way that I can remember her and our relationship. And I haven't really thought about that since I've hung, since he's been hung up again. So, yeah. So we have just a couple minutes left. Do you want to address the, the Oedipus series like you went into, or do you want to take one more question? Uh, we probably don't have time for that, okay. but I'd be happy to answer. I, I don't know if there's any questions remotely, um, but yeah, if, does anyone here who hasn't had a chance to ask any questions, even about the work that isn't right here? If you've seen other works in the show, I'd be happy to kind of expound on them. Yes. It, her, her hand, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's her hand, yeah. Yeah, the question was whose hand is it in Untimely Ripped? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, her hand underneath as she's laying is like just here. And I, I thought about, um, I thought about, you know, in, in, in history of portraiture, there's a lot of these gestures, you know, of hands being kind of brought to chest and here she is in this moment of vulnerability, making a gesture we typically associate it with something that's very heroic, and this is heroic. This is all heroic. No, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for paying attention to those moments. Yeah, please. Yes. I love the warmth of it. All, all, all my works now are on linen. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the quality of it is, is what I really enjoy. But now, as you, I mean, you've probably seen in this portrait of my mom and dad from their wedding day in, in, in 1976, um, um, I'm even using less and less background and letting the linen be more exposed, even in the paintings. So that's something in the drawing, there is, it's just charcoal on linen. But even the paintings are becoming more and more just paint and linen background and that, yeah. Is the linen the it does, it does. It, it grabs the charcoal very nicely. It creates a nice kind of um, rich uh, mark and it holds it in the fibers really nicely. Um, it's, it oh no, definitely a lot of fix, <laughs> a lot of fix. Uh, it isn't as forgiving and erasure as uh, as like a canvas might be, which is a little tighter weave. 
and or, or paper, which is you know uh, forgiving to a certain degree. Um, so I like that when I put the mark down, it has to be deliberate and confident. And even if I want to change something, that kind of echo of that change is like in the fabric and can't be taken away. And so I try to lean into that even more with the, with that work and how like how phonetic it is. You know, it's really about the the adding and the movement and less about um, trying to edit and remove. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. It was really great to hear the inside thoughts behind some of these pieces. Thank you so much.